Hi, this is Greg Remke. I work with Economic Thinking, a nonprofit that provides educational services to high school, homeschool, and college students. And I often focus on speech and debate topics. Uh, this is a uh, part of a presentation I gave uh, last evening for Houston Community College students as a guest speaker. And I've, uh, I'm going to show a part of it that looks particularly at charter cities and the relevance for dealing with the sort of refugee crisis and immigration reform for the European Union. And I hope you'll consider this as sort of a promotional video from my for my uh, economic thinking uh, workshops that I hold for high school and college or for homeschool debate students. So <clears throat> here's the flyer for the workshops for economic thinking. I do these workshops online. I've given guest talks at uh, summer debate camps and I've done a couple uh, fall workshops and I have some more coming up next week. But if your debate club is interested, please contact me. I can do a workshop for your club online and depending on where you are, maybe I can travel, depending on whether your uh, government allows uh, gatherings and so forth. So there's more information. <clears throat> now. The story I'm telling in my uh, uh, that I was focusing on for uh, Houston students was that the immigration issues in um, uh, Europe are part of a broader story of global migration. <clears throat> Nearly 300 million people are international migrants around the world, 3.5 percent of the world's population. In China, uh, as many are migrated within China to the cities. And this has been going on for decades. This is the driving force, along with international trade and international investment, for China's stunning economic growth. Shenzhen, uh, uh, a city is, you know, in China, has had, you know, a charter city has some 20% economic growth annually for like 40 years. It's stunning. Um, migration is a big part of that story. In India, internal migration, some 450 million people have migrated from city to city or from rural areas to cities to work in factories, call centers, take advantage of international trade and development in India in recent years. And this is from a census 10 years ago. India also is the one of the biggest um, migrant waves to the European Union, to the United States, as people are looking for more opportunities and better jobs. Economists argue this is beneficial for the EU and the US as well as India, as well, of course, as the actual people. In Africa, there's migration, so big push of uh, African immigrants and uh, refugees, uh, asylum seekers from sub-Saharan Africa to the European Union, as well as from Middle East, North Africa, so it's part of the migration. Lagos, some 7 million people have migrated over 25 years to Lagos from other parts of Nigeria. Houston, similarly in the U.S., one of the major benefits of the U.S. is migration to uh, from one part to the other so people can leave Detroit and Cleveland and Rust Belt cities and come to uh, Texas where there's more jobs or to Arizona or to Florida. Lower taxes, less regulation, uh, more dynamism in the city. So people come from around the world to Houston. They, they contribute to Houston and Dallas and Austin's dynamic uh, um, um, uh, economic development. So how is this relevant to the EU immigration reform topic? It's important to understand this from Robert Guest, uh, Borderless Economics, looks at how migration is driving economic development. It's the migrants who come into Europe who are reshaping the countries that they came from. The migrants from India into the U.S. and Europe go back to India. They develop new technologies, um, uh, similar. So in Borderless Economics, we talked about the Chinese sea turtles, the, the migrants who left communist China, built businesses elsewhere, came back to invest. They are the initial engine, along with international investment, for Chinese economic growth in India as well. Arrival City is a story of, you know, the largest story in the world, the largest migration, migration to cities around the world, migration from around Turkey into Istanbul, migration into big cities in uh, uh, China, migration to Toronto in uh, on Canada. And so the European Union topic, which you think of the, you know, the regulation, bureaucracy, how do they handle migrants? It's really about migration to cities and the cities in developing countries, Africa, India, elsewhere, don't work as well as they should. 
Latin America. That's why they have migrants. How can we fix those cities or improve them um, to provide an alternative for people to be uh, people being refugees and applying for asylum? Edward Glazer's Triumph of the City. I discussed these, the role of cities more in my presentation. Um, I recommend you can go to this link and watch the first uh, five or ten minutes or the whole documentary called Globalization at the Crossroads. Hernando de Soto, a Peruvian economist and also raised in Switzerland, talks about the role of legal reform for bringing economic development and he tells the story of migration to cities. What's happening now in the developing world is the same thing that happened in the US and Europe and Japan as tens of millions migrated to cities through the 1800s and early 1900s. And then we play part of that segment, which you can see. Um, there's more videos that the Free to Choose offers that are relevant for the topic. One on, you know, why isn't Europe's economy working better? If Europe didn't have the debt crisis and the overregulation and the, you know, the labor problems it has, it would welcome more migrants and more refugees. Now with the lockdown and, and uh, um, the pandemic, it's even worse. But these documentaries give you a sense, uh, free or equal on the bottom right with Johan Norberg, especially good, it's retracing the steps of Milton Friedman's documentary in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is, a, to me, a, a key potential solution to European Union's refugee crisis. Uh, Hong Kong was a refugee city. Uh, vast numbers, hundreds of thousands of impoverished Chinese migrated into Hong Kong, went to work and, you know, became prosperous in a little over a generation. That could happen anywhere in the world. In fact, Victor Coe is trying to build a new Hong Kong in Ireland for refugees from Hong Kong and elsewhere looking to build the future. So refugee cities, charter cities, I would argue a path to the future. And this is uh, what the most of this short, hopefully short, uh, video uh, will discuss. Um, again, uh, this is from my online versions promoting the, this Free or Equal and other uh, resources from Free to Choose Network. And in my longer talk for Houston, uh, I talk about the this essay, Intangible Riches. You know, why is it that European countries are wealthy and countries in Africa aren't wealthy? You know, what is wealth? Where does it come from? This study from the World Bank says, you know, some of it's raw materials, cropland, pasture land, forested areas. Um, that's great. Uh, but that's only 5% of wealth. America didn't get wealthy because we were blessed with natural resources. That's a misunderstanding. Brazil and Russia have as many or more natural resources. Second part is produced capital. These are the machinery, the equipment, the technology that we have in America when we go to work for a, a company that has a big factory. And we think of that as what differentiates us from Mexico. There's a couple hundred thousand of worth of machinery for every American. So that those tools multiply our productivity. But both these together are just 23% of the actual capital that makes, you know, America wealthier than you know, Honduras or other countries, makes uh, France wealthier than Morocco. The big part is intangible capital. That's the other 77%, according to this World Bank study and, and discussed in Invisible Wealth, book by Arnold Kling and Nick Schultz. This encompasses the, the raw labor, the human capital, the skills that people have in a country. Also, the level of trust in society, and particularly the formal and informal institutions. And this is what Hernando de Soto discusses in the uh, Globalization at the Crossroads video. It's really easy to start a company in Hong Kong or Shenzhen. It's fairly easy in the United States. It's much harder in the developing world. It's much harder in Detroit to start a company than it is in Houston. So entrepreneurs would rather start in Houston where they don't have to deal with layers and layers of regulatory um, um, challenges and trying to start in every, it's hard enough to start a business in any case and run it successfully, but having to do, you know, deal with regulatory bureaucracy makes it much, much more difficult. And this is what is discussed in these ideas. The promotion of charter cities is to say, let's have an enclave where we don't have these regulations, where we can draw the cultural capital from uh, some other country or from just international agreements. And that's, again, I'll talk about in the rest of this video. 
How do we measure these things? Well, the World Bank has an ease of doing business index that you can look at where they rank, you know, where it's easy and where it's hard to start a business. There's the Human Freedom Index put together by a network of pro-market think tanks. And they look at, you know, global measures of personal, civil, and economic freedom and how these make a big difference and how easy it is to develop enterprises in uh, prosper and, and advance human flourishing. The Heritage Foundation has a separate index, the Index of Economic Freedom, and Fraser and Cato have another Index of Economic Freedom. These are all ways you can look at uh, if you could advance economic freedom in Middle East, North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have far less pressure for uh, refugees into uh, uh, Europe, which is a source of political and uh, 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 protectionist and nationalist backlash. Also, if you could advance economic freedom within Europe, their economies would become more dynamic and more welcoming to immigrants uh, in various ways as well. The, the populist backlash would be diminished. So background of this whole story, a huge increase in economic freedom as we had the fall of communism in 1990, the economic reforms in China and later India. The red line marks the increase in economic freedom on average around the world. The blue line marks the drop in poverty around the world from you know almost two billion people who lived under two dollars a day in, in daily income now that's was seven seven hundred sixty seven million in 2013 at 2017 it's under 700 million that's a billion less people in absolute poverty at the same time that the world population increased by two billion that's huge progress now the lockdowns and the pandemics have knocked hundreds more people into poverty but we can expect with continued economic freedom uh, poverty to decline and, you know, $2 a day is better than nothing, but it's not as good as $5, 10 or $50 a day. So this move to the middle class, we can expect to continue around the world. International trade, international investment, and migration are three key factors in the global advance to prosperity. And we want to understand the role that these three play. So, Another uh, resource on this, uh, immigration is good for countries, both where they leave and where they come, and, and there's better ways to handle refugees. This startup, refugees.com, is one resource. Um, the idea here, this is an organization in Finland trying to promote development, but the world has changed with cell phones and internet and technologies and call centers around the world. Uh, every refugee camp should be a thriving uh, entrepreneurial enclave of new businesses, job training, and education. But these are locked up in various ways in the status quo. European Union immigration reform could help this. One of the resources I highly recommend is Refugee Economics. This is an Oxford project, the Refugee Studies Center. And there's a short video on this that's very compelling. Remember, we're thinking of refugees as a burden. It's only a burden because people don't have the freedom to help refugees and refugees don't have the freedom to work, to you know, gain employment as they adjust. So this video says, look, refugees, are they economically isolated? No, they're at the center of networks around the world. Are they a burden? They don't have to be. In refugee camps where people are able to work, they create wealth, the one in Uganda, uh, people can walk on and off the refugee camp. They run businesses. It's a source of revenue for Uganda and local uh, people. Are, you know, jobs are created. Are refugees technologically illiterate? Usually not. You, you can see the pictures and videos. People are checking their smartphone. Usually it's the very poorest that can't leave. It's the refugees uh, often have uh, uh, job skills if they're allowed to work in the countries they go to or in the camps. Are they dependent? They don't need to be. So again, you can look at the research on this and get some ideas uh, of how that could be reformed. Another quick relation to charter cities. Here's an Egyptian billionaire who offered $100 million to buy a Greek island as a home for up to 100,000 uh, Syrian refugees. This was in 2015 when you had the civil war. Um, in Syria and the huge uh, influx of refugees into Europe, into Turkey, into Europe, into Greece, and the turmoil around Europe really 
follows from the 2015 crisis. Uh, he wasn't able to get this done. Greece didn't allow it. There wasn't a, a framework in the European Union to encourage uh, refugee enclaves or cities and places like this, but there could be. And this could be a way to um, help millions around the world and defuse, again, the populist tensions in Europe.